Jahan from the Department of Anesthesiology. Um, let me just introduce you. It's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, lecturer and consultant neuroanesthesiologist from our department, the Department of Anesthesiology, Dr. Tan Wei Kiang. He graduated from USM and obtained Master of Anesthesiology from UM. He then developed his interest in neuroanesthesia and underwent his subspecialty training in neuroanesthesia at the National Taiwan University Hospital in Taiwan. He is committed and has ongoing interest in intraoperative neuromonitoring process EEG analysis and pediatric neuroanesthesia, especially in craniofacial surgery. And he is one of the core team members of the Combined Oro Crano Maxillofacial Deformities Management Team in UM. Because he is committed to precision and compassionate care, he leverages advanced neuromonitoring techniques to optimize anesthesia outcomes in intricate neurological surgeries. So he would, he is going to share his expertise with us this morning. So Dr. Tan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction, uh, Prof. Nojahan. So uh, after listening to the first lecture by Dr. Aslina on uh, Alzheimer's disease and its neuroprotective uh, strategies, so uh, let me uh, share with you uh, on the clinical aspects of uh, when it comes to NSPR practice, uh, what do we do to protect the elderly brain uh, when they are going for surgery? So I have nothing to disclose in terms of conflict of interest and not supported by any of the process EEG shown below. So today in this short lecture, I would like to explain on what are neurocognitive disorders and what is a process EEG and the current evidence in research uh, looking for the associations uh, between these two components uh, mentioned earlier, and also what are the recommendations on the usage of process EEG for prevention of uh, post-op uh, neurocognitive disorder. So it is definitely for sure uh, we are having an increasing elderly population coming for surgery every year. And for the elderly populations, uh, besides age as the factors, uh, they do have uh, comorbidities and uh, frailty issues uh, that predispose them to uh, post-operative neurocognitive disorder. And post-op neurocognitive disorders can complicate uh, recovery, prolong hospital stays, and uh, increase uh, financial expenditure. Uh, and some may have reported increase in mortality as well. So according to the DSM 5th uh, edition's uh, criteria, uh, neurocognitive disorders is a clinical diagnosis with a deterioration of uh, any of the seven cognitive domains uh, mentioned in the box here. So patients can be diagnosed with uh, dementia, with the etiology secondary to uh, Alzheimer's disease as we discussed before. It can be due to vascular dementia and also substance-induced dementia. So for those without an etiology cause, uh, they will be labeled as a neurocognitive disorder, which can be subclassified uh, as a mild or major, depending on the functionality in uh, activity of uh, daily living. For post-operative neurocognitive disorder, it is not yet to be defined uh, by the DSM 5th editions. So we actually describe it as a cognitive impairment after surgery and anesthesia, uh, which can be a progression of, of the existing neurocognitive disorder such as Alzheimer's disease, or it could be an acute onset uh, in origin after surgery, uh, leading to delirium or post-operative uh, cognitive dysfunction. So the issue of uh, post-op uh, cognitive dysfunction after anesthesia has, has uh, actually been described as early as 1887, which quoted as uh, insanity following the use of anesthetic in uh, operation. So in order to have a more standardized uh, uh, nomenclature for this issue, in 2018, a working group has actually convened and decided uh, on this uh, new nomenclature. And prior to this, the spectrum of disease includes a uh, pre-existing clinical impairment, which mentioned here, occurring before the surgery. And then patient can develop a post-operative uh, delirium after surgery until the point of discharge. And cognitive impairment following discharge is known as a post-op cognitive dysfunction. But however, the, in the new nomenclature, the patient might suffer from a neurocognitive disorder prior to operations, and then post-op uh, delirium referring to the confusion after surgery until the point of discharge. And there subsequently, there's a period of uh, delayed neurocognitive recovery up to 30 days of discharge. And post-operative neurocognitive disorder up to one year after operation is mentioned on this uh, duration. And this nomenclature basically is helps in terms of a standardization for uh, research purposes. In order to uh, differentiate between uh, post-op delirium and also post-op cognitive dysfunction, 
uh, delirium patient will have uh, altered consciousness uh, while while normal patient will uh, will be uh, conscious uh, under no, uh, for we, we have a normal conscious in the patient with a post of cognitive dysfunction. And the delirium patient will have a shorter uh, course of uh, manifestation and fluctuates uh, within the days in terms of the symptoms and manifest as either hypoactive or hyperactive in manner. And there's also increased risk of a functional uh, decline in delirium patients, uh, but normal function for the patient with uh, post-op cognitive dysfunction. And the incidence of uh, post-op delirium can, can be as, uh, as uh, high as to 50%, with majority hypoactive uh, cases are underestimated. Hyperactive delirium is also more easily captured and also diagnosed. And post-op cognitive dysfunction incidence in one week uh, is around 30%. And those uh, POCD up to three months will range between 10 to 13% and 1% incidence of POCD up to one year. Uh, they can, there are multiple factors affecting POCD and it can be actually range from a non-modifiable uh, factors such as advanced age, lower educational status, patient with history of previous stroke or cognitive impairment. So in terms of modifying uh, factors, uh, today our interest is actually in discussing the role of a uh, process EEG in reducing post-op uh, neurocognitive disorder. So what is a process EEG? Basically, it is a neural monitoring device which read the frontal EEG and generate a dimensionless number to indicate the level of consciousness. And it is commonly used in anesthesia practice as it is a simple and convenient way of uh, delivering or applying the, the strips and it's also time-saving in, in terms of uh, processing and uh, interpretations. And initially, its development is actually targeted to avoid uh, intraoperative uh, awareness. So as you can see, the process EEG is being placed on the forehead in this diagram on the top right. And the machine will read the raw EEG and process it and subsequently generates an index to reflect the current conscious level. So there are a few commonly available uh, uh, process EEG in the market with this uh, BIS monitor being the most popular one and also most regularly used in our in, in the research setting as well. And under normal awake states, the number is uh, near 100 and the optimum uh, general anesthetic range will be 40 to 60, uh, similar with the Cornox monitor here. But for set line monitor as for this brand, the range for GA will be 25 to 50. So for BIS monitor here, uh, the index of consciousness, uh, consciousness will be displayed uh, at this area 51 here. So we've also a raw EEG signal being displayed as well. And there are different types of EEG will actually shown during the different stages of anesthesia. So the, the deeper the delivery of the anesthetic agents, the brain will actually exhibit a burst suppression pattern indicating in the figure of uh, F, F here which is an epoch of a, a isoelectric followed by a burst of a high-frequency waveform. So in order to reduce the post-op neurocognitive disorders, uh, many studies have actually proposed the uh, ideal mechanism of using a process EEG uh, to optimize anesthesia uh, delivery during the GA process. So general anesthesia should be conducted with a manufacturer recommended uh, range, uh, for example, 40 to 60 in this monitor, and avoid a low range of uh, BIS uh, less than 40. So we should also avoid uh, or limit intraoperative uh, burst suppressions. So it has been shown that uh, in an observ observational cohort study by Fritz and colleagues in 2016, that patients with uh, longer durations of EEG suppressions here will result with a more likely experience uh, delirium postoperatively. So there are also several landmark studies trying to prove the causality effects of the use of a process EEG in reduction of post-op delirium and post-op cognitive dysfunction over the last two decades. So this includes a CODA and also Sudoku study published in 2013, a back recall uh, stop study in, uh, published in the subsequent years, uh, Engager study published in 2019, and also Balanced Anesthesia sub-study in 2021. Uh, these are all the RCTs looking at the effects of process EEG uh, versus routine care in assessing the endpoints, which is a post-op neurocognitive disorder in an elderly population more than 60 years of age. So let us briefly discuss on what are the important findings from each study here. So for CODA study, basically it is uh, uh, published in Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology in 2013, 
And this study was done in Hong Kong. And it, has, uh, it, it was done in patients undergoing major elective surgery. And also, uh, it has recruited more than 900 patients. And patients were randomized into BIS and also uh, BIS guided groups, and also uh, which targets the uh, BIS range of 40 to 60 versus a routine care group. And patients have been given GA either uh, via inhalational technique or proper based uh, TIVA techniques. And as you can see, there were significant uh, in terms of uh, reductions of the anesthetic de delivery in these two techniques, in the, especially for the BIS guided group here. So this study also managed to prove that the median BIS range, uh, when we use the BIS monitor, the BIS uh, it will show as a 53, and under the routine care is 38 here. And the time span for uh, BIS less than 40 was uh, significantly lesser in the BIS group of uh, with a median time of seven minutes as compared to 23 minutes in the routine care group here. And CODA study has actually successfully showed that the BIS guided anesthesia reduced the rate of uh, post-op cognitive dysfunction up to three months after surgery as their primary, in primary outcome. And the BIS guided anesthesia also reduced the risk of uh, post-operative uh, delirium uh, during initial hospitalizations by 35%. And these uh, results have actually given the anesthesia community, community a very good signal about the uh, beneficial use of a uh, process EG in elderly population to reduce uh, post-op neurocognitive uh, dysfunction. So similarly, in 2013, Sudoku study is, was published in British Journal of Anesthesia and involved a bigger patient recruitment in a single center in uh, Germany in uh, non-cardiac patients, which compared this guided uh, versus this blinded uh, category. So despite there was no difference uh, in, uh, in the average uh, BIS value shown between the groups, the post-op deliriums, uh, uh, post-op delirium incidence was significantly reduced uh, in the BIS guided group, but not for the post-op cognitive dysfunction incidence here. And from the uh, uh, Sudoku study, basically delirium was uh, associated uh, with an increased length of hospital stay, higher incidence of uh, post-op cognitive dysfunction at seven days and three months after the operation, and there's an increase in mortality. And this study also confirmed that the influence of an uh, extremely low BIS of uh, less than 20 uh, to result in a delirium via a multivariate analysis. So some interesting uh, discussions with uh, Sudoku studies are the patient who are responding with a low BIS value to anesthetics might indicate a higher vulnerability. And there's a difference pharmacodynamic caused by an increased comorbidity, maybe the reason leading to the high mortality in this group of patients. And using the BIS to titrate, anesthetic agent may avoid unnecessary increase in anesthesia level and possible neurotoxic effects in uh, these vulnerable patients. Next, I would like to discuss about the back recall sub-study published in 2014, which involves about 300 patients. And the focus was to discuss on the incidence of delirium in this patient undergoing cardiac and also uh, thoracic surgery. And they basically compare this guided versus an end tidal anesthetic concentration guided uh, anesthesia technique. And the result of the back recall study claimed that there was a near 19% uh, in the BIS group compared to 28% or in the end tidal uh, anesthetic concentration guided group developed post-op delirium, but the result of the uh, reduction is non-significant. Uh, however, the results remain consistent with the other previous finding, suggesting that the BIS guidance uh, decreases delirium after major surgery. And with the data up to 2014, uh, a quick meta-analysis in the same paper basically showed that the BIS guided anesthesia is associated with a less risk of a post-operative delirium with the uh, summary of a odds, odds ratio of 0.56. So in 2019, uh, there was a game-changing publication in uh, JAMA named uh, Engager Study. Basically, uh, this study raised a question in which does a uh, EEG guided uh, uh, anesthetic administration will decrease the incidence of post-operative delirium in, in older patients undergoing major surgery. So there was a 
And this is uh, basically a single center uh, RCT in the United States involved uh, 1,200 patients, a very big RCTs. And once again, uh, this study involved an adult more than 60 years old undergoing a various cardiac and also non-cardiac surgery. The patients are randomized to uh, usual care and the EEG guided group in which the clinicians are encouraged to decrease uh, volatile anesthetic administration based on the EEG information and their clinical judgment. Uh, with the randomization, the uh, EEG guided group shows that there's a decrement of a uh, MAC or the end tidal uh, volatile concentration using uh, during GA, but the duration of this less than 40 uh, and duration of this less than 40 and also the birth time of suppression was half as compared to the usual group here. So surprisingly, the study found that the delirium incidence in post-operative uh, day one to day five was not significantly different between the two with the incidence around 20, 22 to 23 to 26%. Okay. But uh, it's also interestingly to note that the, the mortality up to 30 days here was, uh, was significantly different in, with a lower rate recorded in the EEG guided arm. However, this finding was not uh, discussed in detail by the authors. So uh, the engagers basically concluded that uh, among older adults undergoing a major surgery, electroencephalography uh, guided uh, anesthetic administrations as compared with the usual care did not decrease the incidence of a post-op delirium. And this finding does not support the use of a EEG anesthetic administration for this indication. So there was a definitely invite some criticism about this engagement study in which uh, as this was a single, center, uh, single study center uh, who has a long history of the use and also research involving uh, intraoperative EEG guided anesthetic administration as described by Zoyomi. The clinicians at the, the, at the center basically have been well versed with the EEG guidance uh, of anesthesia and able to minimize the delivery of minimum uh, alveolar concentration of volatile anesthetic, regardless of uh, in the control or intervention group. So the second point raised is that uh, there was a uh, EEG guidance in engagers was deemed to be ineffective, as pointed out by Koch, as the patient in the EEG guided group has tend to spend large time proportion of the time with the base less than 40. Uh, and the reason given above might be the explanations for discrepant results uh, of engagers as compared to the previous study. So uh, in 20. 21. So we have another balanced anesthesia sub-study basically conducted in a multi-center format uh, across three countries, namely in China, Australia, and also US. And they have recruited more than 500 patients. And this uh, randomization of patients to uh, deep versus uh, light anesthesia according to the base value here, uh, using a volatile anesthesia technique. And the study was aimed to examine the delirium incident on the first five day post-op. So the result basically shows that uh, the incidence of post-op delirium in the BIS, in the light BIS group uh, is significantly lower in the deep BIS group. And at one year post-op, the light anesthesia group exhibit uh, significantly better cognitive functions than those in the deep uh, anesthesia. And the, the author concludes that uh, there's, a, uh, support, there's a protective effect of uh, targeting a BIS-50 to reduce a uh, post-op delirium compared with a uh, BIS-35. Uh, so there are also several meta-analyses uh, published along the way to examine the strength of uh, evidence between the process EEG and also post-op delirium. So before the engages of 2019 was published, the uh, McKenzie basically uh, uh, concluded that the process EEG uh, anesthesia was associated with a decrease in uh, post-op delirium. And also by Punja Waks Wong, uh, there is uh, also a moderate quality evidence that optimized anesthesia guided by process EEG index could reduce the risk of post-op delirium in patient age uh, 60s and, uh, and above, undergoing a non-cardiac surgery and also non-neurosurgical procedures. But due to the high discrepant uh, results from engages 2019, the current, the current evidence is not sufficient to support the prevention effects uh, of the EEG monitor on post-operative delirium by soon in 2020. 
So the American Society of uh, for Enhanced Recovery and also Very Operative Quality Initiative has actually met and come up with a recommendation in 2020, which initially says that the, there's insufficient evidence to recommend the using process EEG monitor in older high-risk surgical patients undergoing general anesthesia to reduce the risk of post-op delirium. Uh, however, there, uh, there was uh, additional evidence published after the consensus uh, conference, uh, uh, which leads to the change in this recommendation statement. What it says that the, both organizations produce a dissenting uh, statements and support the recommendation to use process EEG in uh, older and also high-risk surgical patients undergoing GA in order to reduce uh, post-op delirium, as this is evidenced by three large uh, major RCT that found that process EEG was able to reduce uh, post-op delirium by avoiding a BIS, uh, low BIS value, as we have discussed earlier. And as of why engagers failed to show a reduction in the incidence of post-op delirium in the EEG-guided anesthesia, it can be attributed by the insignificant reductions of uh, anesthesia exposure uh, and also even the EEG guided groups in uh, engages spend less spend more time of uh, in the beast less than 40 as compared to CODA trial here. So the confusion uh, assessment was also being criticized, which was not started within 24 hours in, after surgery in engages trial, which might have uh, reduced the pickup rate on the delirium incidence uh, during this phase. So in their opinions, the EEG guided anesthesia might be the most uh, important technique to reduce the risk for uh, post operative uh, delirium. So, to conclude, uh, the use of a uh, process EEG is basically effective in reducing intraoperative birth suppressions. And despite the evidence are equivocal on the effect of process EEG in reducing post op delirium, the American Society of uh, Enhanced Recovery and also Perioperative Quality Initiative still recommend or support the, uh, to utilize a monitor, this monitor in a high-risk elderly patient. So I would like also, also to stress that the post-op delirium remains a product of a multifactorial etiology, which includes a surgical uh, severity and also patient comorbidities, which act as a potential confounders that are usually present during the conduct of trial. So uh, with that, I thank all of you for listening. Thank you, Wei Kiang. Um, we have some questions. Um, I'm going to read them out it's from Tunku Sara, Prof. Tunku Sara. Um, she says that it sounds like using this apparatus would be cost effective. Um, do you? Why do you think the earlier versus strong sounding research was contrary? I think we should have. Oh, the earlier very strong sounding research was contrary. Would you like to yeah. answer that question? Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof, for the question. Uh, for the questions. Basically, this uh, device has been quite uh, uh, applicable nowadays, uh, getting more popularity in terms of our usage here, in, especially in our uh, come to our clinical practice. But uh, I would like also like to stress that uh, we should be able to individualize and also be more uh, cautious when selecting this, this device. In terms of cost effectiveness, uh, agree enough to say that this wouldn't be a very expensive device. It's good to put on, but uh, to put on on all cases, it might be probably incurring much cost. So technically, in patients with an elderly age and a higher propensity to develop a post-op delirium, this is probably the way to go for us as an anesthetist to be more selective and be uh, more choosy in terms of uh, picking the right patients. So generally, uh, if we have a high uh, elderly patient coming for long operations, I would think with the underlying uh, comorbidities assessment, if there's a tendency as we identify as a high risk to develop post-op delirium or chronic dysfunction, I would definitely recommend this as the one of the device used to uh, mitigate the incidence of a uh, uh, post-op delirium here uh, because the the cost to treat a uh, delirium post-operatively sometimes is also uh, is will be in, uh, increased because to manage the patient a uh, delirious patient in what seems to be quite challenging and there will be a more designated or more specialized care will be needed to to manage or to to control the, the patients uh, as an individual so speaking of this uh, uh, 
uh, contrary contrary effects of the of what is being found in Engages 2019. Yeah, surprisingly, uh, I, uh, the paper after publication received a lot of criticisms. So everyone is trying to identify what has actually gone uh, wrong with the techniques and how come it is not uh, being uh, picked up or, or does not respond to the conventional uh, results as it appears. So true enough, I, I would like to uh, echo the one of the points mentioned by the uh, study study uh, uh, author who critiques the paper. Basically, in the center where there is uh, people, who, I mean, there are more groups of uh, anesthesiologists that are very used to uh, this uh, uh, process EEG device. There's a tendency for us to actually uh, reduce on the anesthetic uh, uh, anesthetic dose of delivery. That means uh, when you are when we are trained uh, or the group of uh, practitioners are well trained with the EEG guidance, it will sort of like uh, uh, I will I, or me personally myself I find that there's a, there will there will be a tendency for me cutting down the anesthetic requirement despite uh, it, uh I mean we, we probably as estimated the the need, the need for an, uh, anesthesia is not so high in this group of elderly population but for a person who has no much experience but or just titrating on the very beginning using the bis num as the value or the bis as the reference this would be we will make a difference here. So collectively, if there is a practice moving towards a, a, a more, more wide use of a process EEG in the center, eventually the difference between the two arms will be more lesser and not so apparent. So I would think that that would be probably the contributing factors that is making the study uh, does not receive so much of a, a significant uh, results that is expected. Uh, perhaps a, a multi a multi-center kind of uh, a study protocol will probably reflect more better on the effects as the, we can see a heterogeneous of the practice across the region. And when the application of the newer techniques such as this will probably uh, show that this difference between the, the outcome here. Thank you, Wei Kiang. Um, there's one more question in the chat. Um, good morning, Dr. Could this guided anesthesia be neuroprotective for elderly patients undergoing ECT? Oh, okay. You're speaking of a beast guided anesthesia for ECT. Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting and also uh, uh, challenging questions to, to answer because for us to put on a beast monitor in the process of uh, ECT, by talking about electroconvulsive therapy, right? Uh, usually, uh, ideally, we should actually sedate the patient rather than suppress the, the, the so-called EEG waveform. If possible, we do not want to have an uh, overdosing it. Yeah. So uh, on the theoretical fashions, basically, I, I agree that it will be quite uh, it will it will be interesting and also quite uh, uh, good to support the use of the uh, process EEG use in this setting. But just for to apply this trip over uh, a five or ten minutes job. It, it, I don't see any significant uh, advantage of it. As our current practice, basically, we are still good enough to uh, have the same anesthetic uh, technique and also practice done uh, without much of the problem here. We're actually out of time. There is one more question. Perhaps uh, we can answer this last question. Um, should we make using process EEG as part of our SOP? Okay. Oh, is, yes. Uh, yes. Too, too. Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks for this question also. Yeah, speaking of this uh, uh, this SOP, whether should we make it as a standard, standardized guidelines for uh, for what we need to do is uh, basically the, the, the recommendation is very, not is, is, uh, is by a certain groups. Uh, I mean, over the world, is the recommendation is based by certain uh, practice group which sees the advantage of using this. Whether this would be a, 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 a standard practice for maybe we will say applied across uh, all patients uh, above 60, I still need to think about this uh, cost effectiveness uh, of uh, applying this such a device. Because if we put in, in all the patients above 60, there, there are actually some of the uh, above 60 patients are, appear to be quite uh, not so vulnerable, which is they're still quite fit and strong, which I don't think we will make much changes in terms of our anesthetics uh, uh, medications uh, adjustment. So uh, pre uh, I, my recommendation would be probably more still going gearing towards a more resilient selections of uh, patients that who, thinks, who we think are, are the more vulnerable groups 
uh, definitely this can be actually recommended to patients to uh, add on, but uh, I don't think it has come to a stage of a compulsory uh, need for uh, application at this stage yet, uh, more towards uh, uh, careful selections of patients that would be, be more deemed to be more beneficial for such a uh, uh, device their usage during a major surgery, but perhaps it's more on, I, my focus is also stressing on a major surgery as I will see the effect will be more uh, cost effective when you're applying them. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both our speakers and um, the moderators um, and also the platform for us to share. Um, we hope that today we've learned something about protecting our brains. So thank you so, so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.